I think this is the video a lot of you guys have been waiting for me to make. What is up, Finn fans? Yes. A while back, I think at the beginning of this season, even in this beginning of the off season, I said I was going to judge to a tongue of Iloa off of this season. If he doesn't play the full season, that's part of his judgment. If he, you know, if he's bad, if he's good, yada yada, everything. I'm going to be looking at this year as the year that I'm going to assess and see what Tua is, where he can go, and all that stuff. <clears throat> so I said this was the year. Year's now over. I have a ton of stuff to talk about. We're going, I'm gonna go into a full, like I'm telling you, full deep dive evaluation of Tua Tonga Vailoa. And at the end of it, I'm going to tell you what I think of Tua. And a lot of people want me to, I get a comment a lot about, pick a side. You either for them against them. That's not how that works. That's all I'm going to say about that. That's not how that works. <laughs> you can tell that he struggles, but then still root for him. It, that's not how any of that works. But I have my final evaluation. I have notes on notes on notes that I've been taking on him, doing all my research, all that stuff. So this video is going to encompass essentially why certain people don't like Tua, why, what happened to him, where he is now, did he get better, and all that stuff. So I'm I'm rambling at this point. Let's just jump into this and talk about Tua Tagovailoa. And that is how his name is is pronounced. Tua, Tua, I'm, I'm, I've said it before. I'll pop it up. Tua Ningamaya Lapole Tagovailoa. His full name. But it's Tunga Vailoa with an N, but there is no N in there. It's Tunga, not Tago Vailoa. It's Tunga Vailoa. Uh, and yeah, so in college, you know, we all know about the Georgia game. He comes in, he throws the touchdown, wins the game, everyone loses their marbles. Fun fact, I hated him. I don't like Alabama because of Nick Saban. Why don't you like Alabama because of Nick Saban? You, if you're a Dolphin fan, you'll know why I don't like Alabama because of Nick Saban. So I'm like, ah, they're going to lose to Georgia. Good. I'm tired of them winning national championships. Good. Then, oh, here comes, who's this kid? Tua Tango, Tua Taggy, Taggy Red of Iloa. Who, who's this guy? And then he throws that touchdown. And I'm like, I can't stand this kid. And people call me a Tua stan. I hated him in Alabama. But then all of a sudden, the year after, he really starts to light it up. Unfortunately, he doesn't win that Clemson game. But people started noticing him. People started noticing how well he did. And a lot of people say, well, that's because he had these receivers and this wide receiver. Yes, but he also has to make the throws. He also has to put the ball in the place. And he also has to be smart with it. Not every quarterback can play in the, in the system in Alabama, in Alabama in college football. You put great receivers around a crappy quarterback, he's going to be a crappy quarterback. And the receivers are going to notice he's a crappy quarterback. So Tua, college was a really good quarterback. And then he got injured. And I honestly think if he never got injured, I think he would have went ahead of Joe Burrow. Because I think he would have continued to play in that year. And I think it would have been a big fight in the in the college playoffs. And I think he would have went ahead of Joe Burrow. And I think the Dolphins would have drafted either Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert. And at this point, everyone in the comment section is about to be like, good. <laughs> Not everyone, but I want one of them. So his, he, he, he gets the hip injury. And he got the hip injury because he, he likes to try to do more than he should. Instead of just throwing the ball away, instead of just eating the sack, just instead of whatever, he tries to do too much. And he got sacked a weird way, hurt his hip. Other than that, people call him injury prone, which, you know, he hasn't played a full season yet. But people call him injury prone, which a lot of his injuries, for one, he didn't miss any time besides the hip injury. And their normal wear and tear football injury. The hip, the ankles, he had surgery on them. The hand, that that's a normal occurrence when it comes to a quarterback because you're throwing with defenders around you. So that injury prone label, now it, it's pertinent because he was he had two injuries this season. But coming out of college, without that hip, like I said, I think he goes number one to Cincinnati. But he comes out of college, hip injury. And it's funny because hindsight's always 20 20. Always. Because you're hearing it. People who don't like Tua, who wanted Tua, and, they are, and you know who you are. And I'm not pointing at one person, but there's a lot of people who went to, you know, draft time was coming. They wanted Tua. Now they don't want him anymore. Which, 
I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Your, your thought process, your evaluation of him changed your mind of him. I'll give you mind at the end of this video. I'm not knocking you on it, but there are people. But during the draft, during the draft process, a lot of people wanted Tua. A lot of people had Tua high, even with the hip injury. That tells you how good his college play was. And again, people are saying, oh, we should have took Justin Herbert. We should have took Justin Herbert. Nobody knew that Justin Herbert was going to be the type of quarterback he is now. Nobody. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. And I knew I knew that that kind of in the comment section is going to be the backlash that I got, right? So I went out and I looked up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, I guess you can call them reputable top 100 prospects of that year of 2020. And I, I looked all the way up to April to see what the rankings were for the top 100 in the 2020 draft. I looked up eight. So it's not like, hey, I looked up this one and they said this. No, I gave you, I'm giving you eight different sources. So it's not just one biased source. And this is the rankings of Tua Tungavailoa versus Justin Herbert. Sports Illustrated ranked Tua Tungavailoa fifth, Justin Herbert 20th. NFL.com ranked uh, Tua Tungavailoa sixth, Justin Herbert 20th. ESPN, to a ninth, Justin Herbert 38th, NBC Sports, to a 6th, Justin Herbert 19th, Sports News, to a 6th, Justin Herbert 22nd, CBS Sports, to a 5th, Justin Herbert 18th, PFF, to a 3rd, Justin Herbert 27th, and Draft Network, to a 6th, Justin Herbert 16th. And, I'm, and, and this wasn't there their draft evaluation, their top prospect before his injury. I got all of these numbers at the beginning of April. Weeks before the draft, this was their top 100. They had Tua way higher than Justin Herbert. So all these people who are saying that we should have took Justin Herbert, what a miss, I can't believe it. Nobody saw this coming. Nobody thought Justin Herbert was going to light it up as well he's doing. And he's doing really well. So... Just want to put that in perspective. Again, I back my back my stuff up with facts. Put that into perspective. But again, before the hip injury, and a lot of this, and I honestly think a lot of his problems, which I'll get to, is because of the hip injury. I think that's still uh, either mentally or physically taking a toll on him with that hip. But we draft him. He comes into uh, a system that isn't made for him. You could take that as an excuse or whatever. It wasn't made for him. Chan Gailey is, it didn't make the system predicated towards Tua Tonga-Vailoa. Joe Burrow comes out of Alabama. Uh, Taylor takes the Alabama, the LSU, sorry. Joe Burrow comes out of LSU. Taylor takes the LSU playbook. We're going to implement it into Cincinnati. Justin Herbert, same thing. We, you inject Tyrod Taylor in his lung, collapse it. Up Here comes Justin Herbert. We're going to play around your strengths. Tua Tonga-Vailoa comes in against the Rams. You need to learn what Ryan Fitzpatrick can do. Plain and simple. That's how it went. And that's not that's not an opinion. That's not an excuse. That's what happened. Tua came in. You need to learn what what Ryan Fitzpatrick can do. Tua shouldn't have played last year. Ryan Fitzpatrick should have played the whole year. He shouldn't have been forced in. Ryan Fitzpatrick at the point of putting Tua in was playing really well. I defended Ryan Fitzpatrick. For the first four weeks of the 2020 season, people were asking for Ryan Fitzpatrick's head. And I was defending him. And I get called to do a stand. I was defending Ryan Fitzpatrick. Should not have played. But they thrusted him in because we were beating the crap out of the Jets. They put him in at the end of the game. You heard the roar of the crowd. Ka-ching, ka-ching. That's all they heard that we're going to put two out there next week against, well, in two weeks because our bye got moved. The Rams. Aaron Donald, one of the top defenses, the Rams. Great game to start the, your rookie quarterback who had no offseason, was completely going through rehab through his whole offseason. Didn't fully understand the playbook because it wasn't made for him. Good move on the coaching staff on that one. Tua doesn't play great. Again, he goes six for three. Uh, he gets bailed out once because that Raiders game, again, when he... The, Fitzpatrick came in, the game was tied, but he came in, he did his thing, won the game for us. The Denver Broncos game, Fitz didn't bail him out because Fitz came in through an interception and we lost. So, bailed him out once, but Tua got sat twice. That's no implication to me. 
Because again, if this, the Chargers were in the same situation when it came to playoff berth or trying to make the offseason as the Dolphins were, Justin Herbert would have got benched twice against Buffalo and New England. So that's no implication on him. But last year, six for three, uh, six and three was his record. He threw for eighteen hundred yards, eleven touchdowns, five interceptions. Not bad. Sixty-four point one completion percentage. Had a really good uh, quarterback rating of forty-four eighty-seven point one uh, rating in general. So that was last year. Then all of a sudden, they start implementing things this year. They start adding things this year to help Tua out. Right. <clears throat> and they bring in his offensive coordinators that he was comfortable with, who essentially were on the team last year. Uh, Charlie Fry, bring him in, comfortable with that. So essentially it was the same thing. And we saw some good things in training camp and even in uh, preseason. We were like, all right, maybe there's a different, difference in Tua. But again, my biggest thing I've said about Tua Tungvaluwa is he is inconsistent. 100% inconsistent. But I could say that same thing about Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert is also inconsistent. How is Justin Herbert inconsistent, Doug? He will have games where he will torch the defense, and then he'll have games where he'll suck. Houston Texans game, he sucked in that game. But then, he'll, like I said, he'll come out and he'll have fantastic games where he's throwing bombs, he's throwing darts across the middle of the field, just... Lasers where ESPN, NFL, NFL Network, everyone is just, oh, Justin Herbert. He's the greatest thing since sliced bread. How do you miss on him? I gave you eight people who missed on him. <laughs> uh, but then I'll have the Houston Texans game. We'll have, there was a few games this year. I don't have his stats in front of me where he's had bad. So, two is inconsistent. That's his biggest knock. But the, his strengths, I'm going to talk about his strengths and then we're going to talk about his weaknesses. So this year, Tua Tungavello is stats, right? I didn't talk about it in the year in review. He went 7-5. and five. Uh, He had a 67.8 completion percentage. Went up about 3.7 points. 2,653 yards, 16 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. Not bad. Not great. I would prefer the 10 interceptions I'm not too worried about. I would have preferred like around the 25-ish touchdown. Um number uh his long was 65 yards uh quarterback rating uh 50.6 and his known overall rating a 90.1 so this year again last year wasn't that bad in my opinion some people were already off that ship this year again he had good games he had bad games and a lot of people ask me well, what good games did he have and he had a few good games but again this year inconsistent he will make great throws he'll make really really great throws throws that you're like that's what we need to see more often from you like the i think it was third and 15 third and 14 pockets collapsing around him throws it to Jalen waddle on double coverage first down the passes i think against the giants i think it was two to four and one to parker beautiful dropped it right in the bread basket the two passes to waddle one deep uh, against the Ravens and the other one, I think it was against the Saints. <clears throat> he makes these great throws where he just puts it where it needs to be. The touchdown pass to Waddle in between two, uh, two defenders. He makes these great throws and then he makes the interception against the, the Jets. He throws the two interceptions uh, against the Falcons. He throws the interceptions against the Jets again and then he throws like... <clears throat> And they're so blatantly obvious that he shouldn't have thrown them. And you're like, he, 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 we've seen you make these before. We've seen you make these throws before. Why are you having this lapse, right? And it could be a, a, a number of things, right? Not properly uh, setting his feet again or not throwing from his hips, which I was talking about. It seems like the hip might still be a problem from him. And I talked about that pre-draft, that that is my biggest worry, you can go back and watch it. Go watch my prospect video on the quarterbacks from 2020. I said my biggest worry on Tua Tungvaluwa is will he ever be 100%? Will he ever be the normal Tua with the hip injury? And if that's a th problem that he's still going through where his throws are off because he's not setting his feet properly. I noticed a couple of his throws, his feet were real wide. Is he not throwing from his hip? Is he just throwing from his arm? A lot of these things I'm noticing because, again, <clears throat> his passes are becoming inconsistent. 
like like I said, he'll make some throws where you go, that's that's him, that's Tua. You could build around that quarterback. That quarterback can win you games, and then like he'll throw an interception, and you're like, what are you doing, man? Jaguars game. Who are you throwing that to? Next drive marches down the field, scores a touchdown. You're like, always makes up for his mistakes. Always. So there's that, right? There's the inconsistency there. The ten the you know, you have to ask yourself. I have notes here of talking points I want to get to. So if I if I go off topic or if I start to ramble a little bit, it's because I'm looking down at my notes. His biggest strength, though, to me, is his pocket presence. And a lot of people say, pocket presence? Blah, blah, blah. He was sacked 20 times, right? He played 12 games and he was sacked 20 times. Well, that's an implication to the Miami Dolphin offense line. If you say that, you don't watch football. Because the Miami Dolphin offensive line was bad. It was just bad. Jesse Davis, hot garbage. Austin Jackson, Jesus, my eyes. Dolphins offensive line was bad. Was it the worst in the NFL? Was it the 32nd ranked offensive line? You go to PFF, they'll say yes. Me, no. Uh, They didn't give up as many pressures. Um, To say they didn't give up as many sacks, I will give that to Tua. And you could say, well, that's just you sucking up to Tua. Not really, because again, Tua talking about low with 20 sacks in 12 games. Jacoby Brissett, 19 sacks in five games. Tua played seven more games and was only sacked one more time. Tua is really good at moving in the pocket and getting the ball out quick. Jacoby Brissett, on the other hand, is molasses. He's a he's a sloth out there on the field. So that's the good thing about Tua, right? <clears throat> he's very quick with his passes. He's very decisive with his passes. Sometimes he isn't. Most of the time he is. And the sometimes he isn't, that's when sometimes he gets sacked. Third down, you have Matt Collins going across the middle of the field. Just let it rip, my man. But then he'll take the sack. There always is going to be a comparison to Tua Tungvaluwa, Joe Burrow, and Justin Herbert. Just like there was with Jim Kelly, Dan Marino, and John Elway. I think that was the same year of the draft. There's always going to be that comparison of the three. And a lot of people don't like the fact they call him check down Tua, uh, to only throws the ball five yards. That's all he ever does. He never doesn't do anything else besides that. And I'll pop up a chart for you guys. And I did this last year uh, when I talked about Mythbusters and then checked down to it. So there's a percentage, right? They, t- they took all of his passes and they did a certain percentage. And I'm going to compare him to the other two quarterbacks he was drafted with to see, is he throwing it mostly uh, check downs or behind the line of scrimmage? Or is he in the still the same realm of, normal with his other two counterparts. So Tua Tagovailoa, when it comes to behind the line of scrimmage, so screens and stuff like that, uh, 14%, 14.4% of his passes go behind the line of scrimmage. 487 of his passes are short. The crossing routes, the in routes, you know, curl routes, 0 to 9 yards, 48.7. So a little under half of his passes go uh, 0 to 9 yards. His medium. This has jumped from last year, from 10 to 20 yards, 10 to 19 yards, 25.3. And his deep balls, it was a rare occurrence, 7.5% of his passes went for 20 plus yards. And you could say that's him uh, not trusting himself, and you would be right on some occasions because there were times where he had Waddle open or he'll have a guy open. He'll look at him and then decide to not throw it to him. Again, is that here? Is it his hip? What is it? Why didn't he just let that that sucker go? But then uh, I started looking at the other quarterbacks, right? You look at Justin Herbert. Behind the line of scrimmage, 12.2% uh, of his passes were behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, his short passes, 0 to 9 yards, 51.2%. That is a whole 3% more than Tua Tagovailoa with the short passes. His medium passes, 19.9% of his passes were medium, whereas Tua's were 25.3. So Tua threw a good 6% more within the medium 10 to 19 yards. And then his deep pass is 9.5, and Tua 7.5. So about 2% more, Justin Herbert threw it deeper. Is that because of the offensive line difference? Is that because of whatever difference, the arm strength difference? You take what you want from it, 
But that's the one thing I did notice between Justin Herbert and Tua Tagovailoa is Justin Herbert threw more passes from zero to nine yards uh, than Tua, and Tua threw more medium passes than Herbert. And their deep passes weren't that far off. 2% isn't that far off. Joe Burrow, on the other hand, that is a horse of a different color. Joe Burrow threw behind the line of scrimmage less than both of them, 12.1% of the time. His short was more than Tua. Uh, I think he was less than, her, her, no, about the same as Herbert, 51.2%. So Burrow and Herbert both threw short zero to nine yards more than Tua. Uh, the Both of them threw medium less than Tua, the 10 to 19 yard, but look at Burrow's deep. 13.1% of the time he threw it deep 20 yards whereas you had Herbert at 9% and you had Tua at 7.5% so Tua was more focused on the 0 to 20 yard range and he threw it more within the 10 to 20 yard range than Justin Herbert and Burrow and again Justin Herbert and Tua's uh, passing distances are very similar I'd actually say that Herbert threw it more short Again, only 2% more deep. Burrow, on the other hand, is a horse of a different color. He threw it deep a lot more. <laughs> 13%. So, again, to compare the three when it comes to depth of passes, Burrow is is the one who threw it, the deep, deep, th threw it deep the most. I don't know why I couldn't get that out. But between Justin Herbert and Tua, it's kind of the same. Tua threw it more through the medium Herbert threw it more deep by 2%. Herbert threw it more short by a couple of percentages. See what I'm saying? Like, it was kind of the same. That being said, <clears throat> did the Miami Dolphins build around Tua? Did the Miami Dolphins put Tua Tungaveloa in a successful offense to be successful? The answer is no. Did that affect his play? Should he have played better? Yes, he should have played better. Like I said, I, I when I broke down film, I saw passes he should have thrown that he didn't, um, and that necessarily didn't have to do with the offensive line. A lot of the times the receivers were open, he just didn't throw it. Uh, I, again, there's a few passes with Waddle. There's a few passes with Gazicki. You know, there were passes there he didn't throw. Um, but overall, if you sit back and look at this offense, and you can honestly say to yourself, the Dolphins put the uh, an offense around to a – that helped him be successful and it was his fault they weren't, you're lying. You are lying. And I, I knew it from jump. It's not even like, well, they tried, Doug. What do you mean? Go back and watch my video where I talk about things that worry me or, or, or positions that need to step up going into the season. Number one was offensive line. I had a bad feeling about the offensive line. The Miami Dolphins didn't do enough with the offensive line. It was too young and it wasn't going to work, and it didn't work. Then I had wide receivers on there, and I got flamed for having wide receivers on there. We got Will Fuller, we got Devontae Parker, Jalen Waddle, Albert Wilson, uh, Preston Williams, Ford. We had, what are you talking about, the, uh, the wide receiver, and what happened? Injury, 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 because they surrounded Tua with injury-riddled wide receivers, except for Jalen Waddle, Mike Kaziki. Injury-riddled wide receivers. And then Matt Collins, the most... Um, clutch and reliable wide receiver barely saw the field. And then a running game. What running game? Justin Herbert has a fantastic running game. Joe Burrow has a fantastic running game. Mac Jones has a fantastic running game. Tua Tagovailoa, 32nd ranked running game. Then they bring in Duke Johnson. He does really well. And then they stop running him at points in the game. So no. If you sit here and honestly can tell me that they put the best things around Tua for him to be successful this year, you are lying to yourself. You are absolutely lying to yourself. But does that mean he could, like, is it that's the reason he missed some of these passes? No. But they definitely didn't put, if Tua Tonga-Vailoa had what Mac Jones has around him, what Ryan Tannehill has him, what around him, what Stafford has around him, what Carson Wentz has around him, Tua Tagovailoa would be having completely different stats, would be playing off of the play action, would be able to throw the passes that he can off of these play action plays. You've seen it. There were certain games where the play action was working and he was 
hitting people deep. He hit Kaziki deep on a crossing route because the, the linebackers bit on the play action. If you don't have a defense fearing your run game and you turn around, you play action it, they're just going to drop back into coverage. And then these defenders are just going to beeline it towards you. Having the 32nd ranked uh, run game severely hurts your second year quarterback. You wonder why Herbert and Burrow are so, so successful. Yes, they have really good arms, but you have Eckler and you have the great running game with uh, Cincinnati. So that also didn't help. Um, and then there's the Tennessee Titan game, right? A lot of people jumped off the ship with the Tennessee Titan game. And it was it it was a game that I talked about that he needed to show up. He needed to show up, but he to put him in that situation that he needed to show up in the type of weather it was in. Because look at Ryan Tannehill. Ryan Tannehill didn't do much in that game. They ran the ball on us, all over us, all day. That is the game plan the Dolphins should have had going into the game. The game plan the Dolphins had against the Patriots is what they should have implemented against the Tennessee Titans. So in 15-mile-an-hour uh, wins with rain and, cold and, and and snow and it's freezing and your thought process is we're going to push the ball down the field. That's the plan for this game is dumb. But that was the game that all of a sudden all eyes were on Tua Tonga Vailoa. If Tua wins this game, we just have to beat the Patriots at home, which we did, and we're in the playoffs. And he, and he, he fumbled the bag. Drastically fumbled the bag. He looked off from jump. Snap one, he looked off. And it sucked because quarterbacks are going to have those games. Quarterbacks are going to have bad games. Justin Herbert had a bad game. Hell, at the beginning of this year, look at uh, Aaron Rodgers against the Saints. Horrible game. Quarterbacks are going to have bad games. Joe Burrow versus the Cleveland Browns. Bad game. But it just so happened Tua had his worst game of the year when we needed him not to. And now the magnifying glass was on him for this game because not only was it, you know, an important game, that's it. it, it it's a playoff game. You, you need to win the next two. You went seven straight, win two more, and you're in the playoffs. Well, you won one of the two. So that is essentially my assessment of Tua, right? A lot of, a lot of the things he had to deal with were inconsistent. Um, and then I start asking myself questions. Right? Does he make you pay? Um, and these are the things I wrote down. That's why I'm at this point in the video. Does he make you pay? Essentially, if you have a blown coverage, if you're if you let the guy go past you deep, is he going to make you pay? If if you don't have a single high safety, you don't have safety help over the top in the corner, lets the receiver go by accident. Is he going to make you pay by throwing a one play touchdown? So you're going to ro rocket that ball 50 yards in the air and. and one play touchdown you um what are his limitations could could he be you know can he consistently get better his limitations could they get better as he gets more and more throughout the years because you look at ryan Tannehill, right we want to compare to Tonga Vailoa to ryan Tannehill. ryan Tannehill's first two years with the dolphins were okay but his play was bad well doggy didn't have much around him too didn't have much around him Tannehill had the same around him that Tua's had around him for the past two years. And you can't tell me anything different. I'd actually say Tua, uh, Tannehill had more around him because he had Brian Hartline. He had a good center in Mike Pouncey. Um, he had Richie Incognito, uh, Jake Long for, I think, a year. Like He had actually good offensive linemen in front of him. So look at his first two years. Look at his first two years. Tannehill was garbage in the pocket, absolutely garbage in the pocket. Concrete feet, stared down his receivers, took unwarranted sacks, and made his offensive line look bad. His second year in the league, he had 58 sacks. Not all of that was on the offensive line. I've told you this time and time again, it's a yin and yang situation. If you're going to sit there and not move in the pocket, like Tua did, right? He's only been sacked 20 times out of, what I say, 12 games? 12 games sacked 20 times. But he moves. We saw it last week where he moved, got out of the pocket, got the first down on third and eight. He would have been sacked. Tannehill, his first two years, would stare down his receivers. He wouldn't move in the pocket. And he had horrible deep ball accuracy. He had Mike Wallace open consistently. And he would either overthrow him or underthrow him. Consistently. 
even his, I think his last year with the Dolphins in uh, 2018, that Cincinnati Bengals game. We were up 14, and then he takes two horrible sacks, fumbles the ball, and we lose. He was bad, but now all of a sudden he's in a situation where he starts to play really good, right? So you compare him, and you ask yourself, can Tua get better and over time if you put the right things around him? And that's with any quarterback, right? Quarterback can only mask so much. Look at Dan Marino. He went to one Super Bowl out of his long career. One Super Bowl other than that. A lot of playoff appearances, but that was it. Because he didn't have the right things around him. So if you put the right things around Tua, can he get better? Can he, you know, he learned to, you know, trust his body, trust his head, all that stuff. And that is the things that are bothering me. And those are the things that go into my evaluation of Tua. Now, here's my evaluation of Tua after, what, 20, 30 minutes of me rambling about Tua. Tua has what it takes to be a starting NFL quarterback. A lot of people say he, uh, you know, he'll go into the college, you know, he'll, he'll go to the CFL or he'll go to the Arena Football League and he sucks and he, he'll never play in the NFL. You're wrong. You're wrong. And I know you're probably just trolling certain people because there are people that get a little too sensitive when it comes to Tua. One way or the other. You talk too well about Tua, people get all in their feelings that he sucks. You talk bad about Tua, people get all in his feeling that he's good. Um, but he's a good quarterback. I said the same thing about Ryan Tannehill when we traded him. A lot of people were like, good, I'm glad he's gone. He sucks. He's horrible. He does not suck. Tua is not trash. Tua is not a bum. Tua is not a bust. No. I disagree with that. But he's inconsistent. 100% inconsistent. Um, that is something he needs to work on. Uh, trusting his arm he needs to work on, trusting his his brain he needs to work on. Because we saw it f- like two, three weeks in a row where he'll roll out to his left and he was missing passes. But his first year against the Chargers, he was dotting them up on those rollout passes. That was his bread and butter rolling him out to the left. He was throwing great passes. Now all of a sudden this year he can't do it. So he's inconsistent. Inconsistencies can be fixed and they can get better. But here's the thing. Will, I, I asked you this, you know, about a couple of minutes ago. Does he make you pay? Now, blown coverages. He this year he made you pay, right? You left you got the guy butt naked open like Albert Wilson and Jalen Waddle. He made you pay. We either got a big yardage or um, we got a touchdown. He made you pay. But if you blow past the corner, right? Corner's covering his man and then he goes by him. He's going to make you pay, and I don't think so. And this, my assessment again, is right now, two two years in, right now. Down the road, Cody? Yeah. I think he, I and again, my assessment, I think he's going to get better as time goes on. Because if you look at his stats, he's gotten better from last year to this year. He went up in um, interceptions, but he also went up in touchdown, but he also went up in completion percentage. So he, he I do think he will get better. But here's the problem. Ryan Tannehill, his second year into his NFL career, he did not have a Deshaun Watson in the wings. Now, I've listened to you guys, I've read your guys' comments, and a lot of you guys don't want to touch Deshaun Watson with a 10-foot pole because of what's going on. And I understand that. But we're not making these decisions. <laughs> we're not making these decisions. And the stuff that Tua Tungavello went through, uh, going up to the trade deadline, I wouldn't be surprised if he asks for a trade, if his agent asks for a trade. There are the conversations that on social media that he had where he said, I'm looking forward to next year with my guys. I think Gesicki said we'll throw it 40 times a game. Uh, hopefully that's implementing that Gesicki will be back. So will he be on the team? I think the Dolphins are going to, again, go after Watson, and we'll see how that pans out to decide if he'll be on the team. Do I want him on the team? I don't know. And I know you that's not the answer you guys want to hear, but I say I don't know because I don't know who the head coach is going to be. If it was uh, Brian Flores, I would have said no because I don't think Brian Flores is going to put the right players around him for Tua to be successful, and then it's just going to be another situation where we watch our quarterback either consistently under pressure or just struggling in an offense that is just garbage because – Brian Flores doesn't know how to work on that side of the ball. But right now, I don't know who the head coach is. And I don't know what 
the head coach is going to implement, whether he's an offensive or defensive type of coach or what. Uh, but again, the Dolphins are going to make another push for Deshaun Watson. As much as you don't want him to, they're going to. They did a very big, hard push for him uh, this past season, uh, this past offseason, and towards the trade deadline. They're probably going to do it again. He's a top five quarterback in the NFL, but he has horrible off the field issues that he needs to settle. He needs to settle. Or this fan base is not going to want him. And I did a poll. I'll pop it up. I did a poll. Do you want to move off from Tua Tagovailoa? I did it here and I did it on Twitter. It was an emphatic no. <laughs> a very emphatic no. Um, so I think Tua is going to be really good. And I think with time, and I, that's the biggest thing, though, that people didn't, people expected what the Bengals and the, Chargers are getting out of Burrow and Herbert. We would get out of Tua. That's what people who are off that ship are expecting, and I, and I understand it, right? Because you see Tua, what he did in college, all of a sudden, why do we need to wait for him to develop when the Chargers and the Bengals don't have to wait for Herbert and Burrow to develop? What happened that now we have to wait for this guy to develop, but they don't? And that is another thing that you have to ask yourself, right? Will he, you know, at this at year two and and Tua Tagovailoa's career, is he anywhere near Burrow and Herbert? And the answer is no, he's not. And you can say that the it's the offensive line and the weapons around him, yada yada, blah blah blah. But if you look at a pure passing aspect of it, he's not. Tua is nowhere near Burrow and Herbert right now. And that is why so many people are jumping off the ship of Tua, and that's why so many people want to trade for Deshaun. Well, not so many, but people want to trade for Deshaun Watson. It's because we expected a big jump from Tua now that he's had a year under his belt and he has a playbook that he's comfortable with. And But there wasn't that jump. He still had his struggles this year. He still had his bad games this year. He still had what? Uh, he had a two interception game against Atlanta. He had a two interception game against Carolina. Oh, sorry, those are sacks. Uh, a two interception game against the Jets. He had two two interception games this year, and then he had a one interception against New England the f- first week. One interception against Jacksonville, Buffalo, Buffalo. Uh, one interception against the Jets again, and then New Orleans and Tennessee interception, interception. So. They, he was supposed to be pro ready. All those, all those eight players, uh, eight, you know, websites and stuff that I told you had them had Tua ranked higher than Justin Herbert. It's because they thought he was pro ready, and he is, but he needs more time to develop. And and I don't know if the Dolphins are going to wait for that, and I don't know if a portion of the fan base is going to wait for that. So again, my evaluation of Tua Tagovailoa after year two. Uh, I don't think he is where uh, Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert are right now, but I do think he will get better. And I do think if he's in the right system with the right coach, and I, he doesn't even need an elite offensive line. He doesn't need elite wide receivers because he was putting up great numbers with backups besides Waddle and Kaziki. He did the same thing last year with backups. I don't think he ever played a, a, a full season with all of his starting wide receivers. I don't even think he played more than three games with all his starting wide receivers. He doesn't need elite things. He is putting up these numbers, these completion percentages, this pocket presence, all that stuff with no run game. You give him a decent run game, you give him a decent offensive line, I think he will win you a ton of games, he'll get you in the playoffs, and I think he'll win a playoff game. That's my assessment of Tua Tagovailoa. Put Tua in the same situation that Mac Jones has, Tua's getting to the playoffs. Put him in the same situation that Burrow and Justin Herbert has, I think Tua's getting in the playoffs. That's my assessment of Tua Tagovailoa. I don't think he's a bust, I don't think he's horrible, but I do think he has work to do. And I don't think he's a finished product. and I But I don't think he's anywhere near Justin Herbert or Joe Burrow. And that's my assessment. 40-minute video giving you guys my assessment of Tua. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's a long one. Uh, thank you for getting all the way to the end. Uh, I hope you watched the whole thing and heard everything and didn't stop at points you agreed or disagreed with and commented. Listen to the whole thing. But I will see you guys. I got some. I'll see you tomorrow. Because the Dolphins asked to interview a few more people. So, 
I, my job never ends and I love it. We'll have every minute of it. So, and then I think I'm going to do predictions for the playoffs. So that'll be fun too. So other than that guys, I'll see you tomorrow. But like usual, stay classy. I'm Fins out.